And we're alive, everyone. Welcome back to this week's episode of the Trick Podcast. I'm Fred Lambert, your host, and I'm joined with Seth. How are you doing, Seth? I'm well, Fred. Great. Uh, this week, we're going to start with, uh, we have a few quick question already in the, in the um, comment section of the YouTube live. So we're going to address those because we have a few good ones. Uh, if you have more, you can uh, leave them down right now and we're going to address them. But uh, Matt Hask, uh, has SF Mortar announced how many units they plan on producing. So that's in reference to SF Mortar taking over the um, uh, former Hummer plant in uh, Indiana. So that happened last year, but they just now took over the plant. The acquisition happened last year. Now they took over the plant and they announced a $160 million investment to retool it to produce their uh, all electric uh, SUVs. And uh, I think it's pretty cool. Uh, the SUV look cool. We don't know much about it instead of just some vague specs and uh, a really early concept vehicle. But um, it's going to have tech made by uh, Martin Heberhard. And uh, if you remember, Martin Heberhard is the original co founder of Tesla Motors. So pretty exciting stuff on that front but in terms of the how many units they plan on producing they haven't released anything on that so we, we would just be speculating but uh, i don't think it's gonna be a uh, high volume because we're talking about 160 million investment which sounds big but for the auto industry it's not it's just really not that big talking about uh, uh fewer than 500 employees so i mean unless it's a highly automated production line i i find it hard to believe that it's more like that 10 to 20,000 units per year. I don't know if you have an opinion on that, Seth. Yeah, I think that even that might be high for the first year. Yeah. They're, they've got to start from scratch. I think, you know, remember when Tesla started from scratch, they were making a few thousand per year at most. Yeah, I think, yeah, 5,000 might be more uh, uh, closer, uh, a better ballpark, I think. Uh, Beasties38 uh, asks, what do you think of the Porsche Mission E Performance Edition having a rumored 1.90 to 60? I mean, I, I didn't even know that it was a remote Porsche uh, Mission E Performance Edition. I, I know that they were planning three different uh, trims, but I, I wasn't wasn't clear that one would be like a performance one, and certainly not at one point nine for the zero sixty miles per hour launch. And uh, to me, it doesn't make sense because Porsche was on record saying, like, criticizing Tesla's insane launch performance, uh, saying that uh, instead they wanted to focus on track performance and be able to go that high power for a longer period of time to get a good race track experience for their owners who are Porsche owners are pretty used to that so that would make more sense to me didn't, about you. didn't Jaguar engineers uh, mention something about a uh, like they could get it up to 1.9 but it would like it or down to 1.9 but uh, the that much speed in the hands of mere mortals would be dangerous exactly they, they did say that this week uh i never heard something like that from porsche uh so maybe, porsche maybe. was more about like the the balancing the long term uh long term like long period of a uh, high out power output versus a short uh, short burst but uh yeah it will make sense too i mean there's there's a reason a lot of people are crashing their tesla it's because it's a lot of power in the hands of people who just don't know how to use it yeah, and and I think uh, Porsche kind of set, wants to have a better track uh, speed, you know, going around those big like Nuremberg loops. Um, so they probably are more focused on long sustained output. Um, additionally, uh, I think what we are most interested in from Porsche uh, is their charging speed and uh, you know their their claimed uh, ability to charge two hundred forty miles in fifteen minutes, which would be pretty impressive. Yeah, that's the the one we need. Uh, we need to see to believe it. Uh, yeah, uh, the acceleration, like we know it's possible. I mean, we experienced it at the uh, uh, at the Roadster launch, so it's very possible that Porsche can do it with a much bigger battery pack. So it would be like the the higher end version. But uh, again, based on their current comments, I don't see it happening. Uh, what else do you have? Any other question? And any news on the Model Three ramping production after the latest shutdown? The, yeah, um, the multi production was shut down this week or for most of the week. We don't have an update yet, but I expect that we uh, we're gonna have one next week, uh, like early. Normally, like every week or so, we give an, an early update on multi production on Monday or Tuesday. We should have that again uh, next week. Yeah, and, and kind of what we were expecting, which was the the huge Canadian rollout. Um, and I, I get I guess this is a good segue into the stories of the week. Yeah. Um, we we've kind of been thinking that um, if Tesla had uh, too many cars 
uh, to put in the U.S. market so that they would, you know, in June they would hit um, 200,000 and therefore quarter two hit 200,000, which would knock them down a, uh, a block in the uh, uh, incentives um, that they would kind of uh, divert more cars to Canada. And it feels like uh, June is, is Canada month for the Model 3. Um, yeah, well, at least this week, yeah, for sure. This week, for sure, yeah. Yeah, we're talking about uh, 200 units per day that they were trying to deliver in Canada, up in, in, in Canada just, just in Toronto, in the Toronto region. So they took over the international center near the airport in, uh, in Toronto, just outside Toronto. And uh, starting on, the, I think it was Tuesday, uh, at least Wednesday, well, Wednesday and Thursday for sure, but maybe even they started on Tuesday for a few deliveries. Um, they, they had a few buildings there full with uh, filled with Model 3 vehicles, and they did the group deliveries. So we, we talked about last year about Tesla trying to experiment with group deliveries. So having a bunch of people at the same time trying to streamline the delivery process. Because Elon Musk at some point said that he thought that as soon as Tesla figured out production, which they sort of did in the last few weeks with uh, achieving a, a rate of 3,000 units per week, that the ball, the ball neck would be an actual deliveries because Tesla doesn't have that many uh, stores and not that many employees uh, at the retail level to to do the, those deliveries. But um, but yeah, so right now we they're pretty much experiencing that in Canada. And uh, we reported too that uh, a bunch of uh, Model 3s were sent to Montreal, so not just Toronto. Toronto has the bulk of uh, the deliveries of the volume. Uh, that's probably going to be in the low thousands uh, after a few weeks. Uh, but Montreal got a few uh, dozen units too. And um, we I also saw a uh, one of our readers tipped us to an Instagram account uh, in Vancouver. Yeah, Vancouver, uh, where there appears to be quite a few Model 3s being delivered. Yeah, so those are the three big centers right now for uh, in Canada. But we also saw a few today in Calgary. So Calgary got a few cars too. But uh, yeah, Ontario and Quebec are going to be the big market also because of a huge incentive of $8,000 for Quebec and $14,000 for, for Ontario. And some people are afraid that with elections coming up uh, this summer and uh, this fall, uh, this summer in Ontario and this fall in Quebec, that they could go away those uh, uh, those incentives so they they're hoping to get the little delivery so, uh, as soon as possible but of course like it's it, it's does the same problem that you basically have to already have a reservation this year in canada to be able to get that uh, that model three anyway so it's just about uh basically choosing an option that gets you your car sooner and right now that's uh that's the model three rear wheel drive with a long range battery pack though the all-wheel drive should be coming uh and the performance version should be coming in the next 12 weeks or so yeah, and the, and the performance editions are going to be the first ones out of the block, and uh, yeah, which th that's one of those things that it's kind of frustrating, but uh, it's par for the course. Tesla, yeah. as they ramp up, you know, the cost structure. It's always been like that. Always yeah. been like that for Tesla. And the performance version always been the first, so it's not a big surprise. But since they started the opening the orders at the same time, I think it's going to be pretty close to deliveries. I yeah, and I don't think that many people are going to pay seventy. I mean, if you know, if you want a performance car uh and you have tons of money you're probably going to get the model s or x um, yeah that that too but i mean they could like they, they could just do a production like in order to streamline production just do performance production for a full week or just a few days mm -hmm. and uh, at the current rate that alone it's uh like you you, you work through that backlog of performance order pretty quick unless that's like at like ten thousand orders for those who don't know but uh, not impossible i think um yeah but you, you were just speaking about the cost so that's a good segue for the oh uh, no we, we should talk about the international expansions and we're just talking about canada with the model 3. uh and then Musk this week also gave a, a better timeline on the uh, model 3 deliveries outside of uh north america so uh european markets and uh in asia and uh, what what so originally was about supposed to be mid 2018 and it got pushed to late 2018 and now it looks like European markets are going to see, at least uh, left and drive uh, European markets, are going to see the car early next year. So even though you're a first day reservation holder, uh, it might add up to actually like, if, if it's in March, like March is, is still early 2019, right? Yeah. <laughs> Technically. So you could be, uh, someone could have been waiting like three years in Europe to get to Model 3 because they could have reserved it on the, on 31st, 2016. And that's the, the left hand drive, uh, the yeah, right hand yeah. drives. Going to be even longer 
yeah, you said mid uh, mid 2019 for all the write and drive market, uh, uh, European and Asian market. So that's uh, that's the UK, that's uh, Japan, that's uh, is Australia. Australia is it right hand drive or no? Left? It's left. Or, no, it's it's the same as uh, the UK. So right hand drive. Right. Japan is too. Yeah, Japan is. Range. That's for sure. Not that many market left uh, that are right hand drive. Yeah, it's weird that we're still doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, so what was I, what I was saying was about the costs. So that was a big story this week that came out because, um, well, it was already a big story when the German magazine, uh, don't make me uh, name it, no. <laughs> Wishcraft Work, uh, not sure. Uh, they, they reported on, uh, it's a big magazine though uh, in Germany. And they reported on an engineering firm there that uh, bought a used Model 3 on the on the market on the used market in in the US and brought it to Germany to do a, a full reverse engineering tear down uh, and benchmark the vehicle. Uh, we, we reported on a few of that in the last few months uh, st since the um, start of mulch production. Uh, a few of them were done by actual German automakers like they did with the Model X before and the Model S before that. But the, with the Model 3, there's a big focus on cost. So they want to know how Tesla is managing to bring the cost down in order to eventually make the car for $35,000. It's not the case right now. But one of those firms um, talked to that German magazine and, and said that based on their teardown, they uh, ended up with a material and logistic cost of just $18,000 and a labor cost of $10,000 for a total of $28,000. So we which reported is, on... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so that's of the of the base model thirty five thousand dollar one, which doesn't even really exist yet. That, that wasn't that wasn't clear though. That wasn't clear. That's that, oh, that's yeah. the thing. Uh, the, the way they said it is that they think that it can be optimized to twenty eight thousand dollars at a production rate of ten thousand per week. So, but this, are they talking about the one that's out with the long range battery? That's the biggest question. Like it, it would make sense since since they for sure did a tear down of the long range version, which right. has a seventy five thousand uh, seventy five kilowatt hour battery pack, so it should be more expensive. But the. Uh, the way I read it, and I, I'm not German, so I asked a few people, and I, I look at the translation, and asked a few people that that read German, and the way they made it sounds that it's more once they uh, they get the production of ten thousand a unit, and you make you you average it down, the average could be twenty eight thousand dollars, which would be pretty impressive because the actual uh, selling price should be like. Well over forty thousand, right? Like the average price once once the the, the base battery pack comes out, could be like forty five thousand dollars average price, like ten thousand over the standard price. After you add a few option and you you account also for the performance version, just dragging the uh, the range a lot higher, right? So twenty eight thousand would be like a big gross margin. So anyway, we published the report and we we were skeptical about it. We said we we take it with a grain of salt because of uh of what we just said basically. But then Elon Musk uh, commented on it and said that uh, he called it the best uh, analysis of uh, of the Model Three so far. So, like like we said, there were a bunch of other tear down before, and uh, he said that this one was the best. So when he said that, I asked him like, so, like the the lead of that report was that um, the cost could go down to about twenty eight thousand on average at ten thousand units per week, and then Elon responded definitely. So he definitely thinks that. The cost could go down to twenty eight thousand on average, and uh, I think that's a big statement because. Yeah, that, I, mean, I mean, even at thirty five thousand, that's a twenty percent margin. You know, yeah, with the base price. Yeah, yeah so. and he did say like twenty five. The way he's, the, the only thing he said before is that he sees a twenty five percent margin achievable uh, for 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 the model three, but that's twenty five percent overall. Uh, yeah. Twenty-eight thousand average. What what does it mean overall? It mean like closer to thirty, like easily thirty, even more than thirty. And Model, Model S and X have never achieved that yet. So I had a follow-up question to Elon Musk that he didn't respond to. And what happened there? Yeah, uh, uh, and I think it made a lot of sense because my question was regarding a battery cost breakthrough. I mean, if what he just said is true. And also linked into the Tesla Semi thing, because uh, we, we, as we discussed in the past, uh, the cost of the Tesla Semi and the uh, size of the battery pack in it points to also a big cost improvement for for the batteries. And now, on now with this comment too, I'm thinking that Tesla has something in the in their pocket, like in the, up their sleeve, uh, about the battery cost here. I think it can it can be like 
they could be break if ten thousand because it, supposedly the the aim for ten thousand units as soon as next year, right? Yeah, I mean five thousand at the end of this quarter, right? Yeah, and ten thousand sometime in two thousand nineteen. What else is coming in two thousand nineteen from Tesla? Truck. The Tesla Semi. Yeah, the truck is coming too. <laughs> um, but so this report also mentioned that the cobalt content of the batteries was a lot lower than anything they've seen. I think right, or they said yeah. something like, to that effect. So, do you think that their uh, cost breakthrough could be related to uh, eliminating cobalt from the equation? I know yeah, we we talked about expensive. that with uh, Galileo when he when he was on. Like, if you, uh, I just don't see that being a big factor. Like, it, it is, it does make a little difference, but because it looks like there's a significant difference between what Tesla is doing with cobalt and what others. Like, this analysis says two point eight percent cobalt. Uh, in the old battery and uh, other companies are like at eight percent, so it's like almost three times less. But even three times less, it's like going from twelve uh, kilograms per car to four kilograms per car is like not that big a difference. Even though it's it's expensive, like it's a few hundred bucks of difference. Uh, so it I wonder makes, if that affects the process at all. Makes it easier. That's a good point. So if if having uh, less cobalt in the battery cells make the production process easier, that could make a, a bigger difference. Uh, but that that's just speculation. I don't, I don't know about that at all. Though. But it, it's not impossible for sure. Yeah, you know, um, Elon kind of threw water on that. So two things. One, he kind of threw water on the, the we need some kind of breakthrough to get the, the economics of the truck to go. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if it's a you know big breakthrough or just... Their their costs are just coming down, and you know, at, at such a rate where they know that they can make some very inexpensive batteries. And the second thing is, I forget when it was, but there was a, I feel like it was a earnings call or something where, um, just like as an aside, he was like, "There's no big battery breakthroughs coming at all. Like we've we've checked, we've vetted everything, and there's nothing out there except this one thing. Yeah, that we're not going to talk about. But you know, it sounded like they had something that." You know, might be interesting. So yeah, but I also try to make a difference between a big technology breakthrough and a cost breakthrough. Like a cost breakthrough can not necessarily come with like just a, a new chemistry uh, or just a new technology coming to market, but just figuring out like a, a big uh, supply chain issue. If you, if you figure out a big supply supply chain is a big part of the cost of the batteries. If you yeah. figure out uh, a, a big supply chain improvement or optimization, can makes a big difference on the price. You combine that with uh, material costs. You combine that with the uh, production process. And there's a lot of different things that can come together and, and create what you would you could call a battery cost breakthrough. Not say battery technology breakthrough. So even though yeah, it did definitely throw cold water on the battery tech breakthrough. Uh, I'm I'm still thinking that the battery cost breakthrough could be the answer to uh, our many question about the Model Three cost and uh, also the Tesla Semi cost. Yeah, and and of course the economics of scale, like that that gigafactory is the biggest battery factor on earth or battery factory on earth, and it sounds like right now it's not running um, as smoothly as it could be, and, but it seems like they're on their way there. And as automation kind of you know takes human beings and out of the equation and speeds things up, you know, all of a sudden the labor costs go way down, and uh, you know the the per kilowatt hour battery price is going to continue to drop pretty rapidly yeah and also there that everything you said applies to both the battery cell and the battery pack too so like panasonic could be making improvement to the manufacturing process of the battery cells then tesla could make uh, advancement to the battery module or the whole battery pack and when you combine those like the, the goal is to reduce the cost per kilowatt hour of the whole battery pack there's like 10,000 things that you can improve in that. So, the and if you approach it with like the first principle that this uh, Tesla's approach it with the French principle, uh, way uh, I'm sure I'm sure there can be some surprises there. But speaking of cost, about the cost of insurance, that's not fun. No, not at all. No, and especially not for for Tesla vehicles. As uh, this week, the Model S in the U.S. topped the list of the. Uh, most expensive uh, vehicle to insure. And um, what was the price? Uh, sorry, I'm not finding it. Okay, okay. Uh, with an annual, so that was based on uh, the uh, Insurance Institute of Highway Safety. 
that gathered a bunch of it's an insurance company group in the US, a non for profit insurance company group, and that gathers the data. Then uh, 24 7 Wall Street put an analyst together to have a list of the 25 most expensive vehicles, and the Model S topped it with an annual average insurance paid of $1,789 and an annual collision insurance paid of uh, uh, thirteen hundred and ten. So, so that's you add those two up and you get like three three thousand dollars. Well, or is that how? How does that no, work? Well, the insurance is cost of seventeen hundred. That's that's what the average people pay in the U.S. Oh, okay. for S. Then uh, the uh, country insurance paid. Uh, I assume that's uh, so like the, the payouts. Uh, yeah, the minimum payout, the average payout that uh, people get. Gotcha. annually for for the mall s well, that's nice the insurance companies make four hundred dollars per person yeah 460 so that 70 bucks per person that's not that's not too bad yeah it's pretty profitable i think <laughs> it's an insurance law if, if it's you know what right, it's tesla bad. should get insurance into the insurance game yeah uh it make well, some money you know what <laughs> You know what? We should we should uh, look into that though, uh, since we have uh, a, a lot of um, people in the electric readers are also Tesla owners. Uh, what I heard is that in Norway uh, they banded together to get a deal on the insurance. Um, they, they they reach out to a company and just start sort of a group buy thing, if you will. And apparently they got that down to like six hundred dollars per uh, on average wow. between US six hundred dollars, which is a third of that, so <laughs> a, a very big difference. You know, it's kind of interesting. Um, so, you know, the the idea of Tesla getting into insurance. Um, Tesla can do a lot of things uh, that a normal insurance company can't, uh, which you know obviously is controversial. But um, you know, they could they could charge you insurance based on your mileage, for instance. You know, they they have access to how many miles you drive, how many highway miles you drive versus city miles. You know what kind of areas you drive in? Are they dangerous areas? Are they so they could give you a very fine grained uh, cost structure, uh, which would theoretically save more people money because there's less risk for Tesla mm -hmm. or the insurance company. So it, it's kind of interesting that a you know with a car company becoming a insurance carrier, um, there's a lot of things that Tesla can do, and and clearly you know they have access to the log. So and we know how that works. Um, so if you know you say, well, I don't know, autopilot was on. I don't know yeah, why. That's I crashed. the bigger thing, I think. Right. <laughs> so uh, no one can lie on the insurance claim. Uh, well, no, there's still room to uh, uh, if you want to do something. But uh, yeah, I think that's a bigger difference. But right. what you just said, though, uh, insurance companies are starting to do it with uh, some mobile apps, though. I know my my insurer uh, offers that. Yeah. Download the mobile app and the uh, the track you and everything. So it's not. It's a bit shady to have the insurance credit uh, tracking you all the time, but if Tesla can already do it with with your car, might as well do it for your insurance. Right. Um, but yeah, uh, it looks like Tesla's insurance um, effort is is expanding uh, really. Uh, so we reported that back uh, almost two years ago when it, it started in Australia and uh, in Hong Kong. Now uh, we reported earlier this year that it expanded to the U.S. and, and North America, and they just hired a, a new head of that program for for North America. Uh, Alex Cisenikos. Um and hard, hard names today. Yeah, another hard name for me. Uh, what's interesting is that the guy is coming. Well, he's been with a bunch of different uh, insurance company, especially in the in the digital department, trying to digitalize uh, insurance. But he, he was also a former executive at Liberty Mutual, which is a Tesla's partner for the Insure My Tesla program in the in the U.S. So, like, there's a uh, looks like right, the right person to um, to be in charge of that program. And how, how we learned about that is that uh, he's actually going to be at a conference uh, later this year in October. And uh, they sent out a press release for it. And the, the actual keynote presentation title is Building a Customer-Centric Insurance Company for Tesla. Uh, it looks like they want like no paperwork or at least only digitalized paperwork. Uh, a streamlined experience for the customer. Yeah, and insurance is already a pain in the in the backside. So anything <laughs> that they can do to smooth that process would be nice. Uh, also, like just saying insurance conferences sound like the most boring thing I can. It's it's of. not even an insurance conference. It's like that that's a thing too. <laughs> yeah. the, the, that's why I, I was surprised to see it there. 
because uh, no, it's a uh, for uh, it's utility dive, which is uh oh now they removed the thing. Oh, yeah, I was just going to have a link to. It. Yeah, they they removed the link to it, so maybe they, they send that out a little bit too early, maybe, or he shouldn't have been saying those stuff in the in the press release. I was surprised because it was weird, like uh, a few months ahead. But I checked with Tesla and they didn't deny anything. I wasn't there. In the PR release, so it should be all right. Uh, it was uh, something about the um, electric utilities, so a weird one. But speaking of uh, new hires at Tesla, uh, Tesla did a weird thing the past few weeks. They announced a bunch of new hires, uh, something that they don't usually do for anyone outside of uh, like uh, C level employees, uh, executives. But um, in the past week, they sent out two. Uh, blog posts about hiring a bunch of new execs and um, it seems to be like in response to all the, the reports in the past few months of uh, people leaving the company and uh, uh, those reports are always frame as uh, Tesla as a big uh, turnover rate uh, uh, something that's it's, they never say it's unusual for Silicon Valley because it's just not <laughs> it's uh, it's pretty standard there but uh, the, the, the article make it sounds like it and um, so it, since Tesla doesn't usually do that, like either we report uh, a, a new, a new somewhat high-profile hire, uh, or already just goes under the radar completely, they don't normally uh, announce that. Uh, Maybe the they're best, trying, to, trying to scoop us instead of us breaking. Yeah. they're just trying. They're like giving up. I'm like, all right, we might as well just announce it. I mean, just the Jim. I use Jim Keller in their article for an example. Jim, Jim Keller is probably Tesla's biggest hire. Ever like a uh, most high profile hire ever? Oh, sorry about that. Uh, most high profile hire ever, and they weren't the one to announce it. Like we we had to reveal it like a month later or something like that. So the fact that they didn't announce that, but now they announced uh, what did they announce? They uh, they announced uh, Stuart Bowers was VP of Engineering. So that that was the the biggest one last week. The, the guy from Snap, um, machine learning expert that worked at at Facebook and Snap. Uh, they announced a new director of uh, energy manufacturing, so all of Tesla's energy product. Uh, his name is Niaj Manaho uh, from Apple. Not the guy was leading a technological operation team at Apple. Uh, what else? What else? Our new director of production engineering at the Gigafactory. So uh, probably going to work with, I uh, uh, forget his name, but uh, the VP of Gigafactory. There's a former guy from Lego, from uh, was building the Lego blocks. Uh, this guy is coming from Tin Film Electronics, so that's uh, uh, that's a semiconductor company, I think. Yeah, films, uh, semiconductor company. Uh, a new CFO in China for Tesla company. Of course, Tesla is growing like crazy in China, so they need a, uh, a bigger leadership thing there. So now they have James Zhu. Uh, Do we know CFO. if uh, Tesla is going to uh, roll the Model Three out to China? I can't remember if we had that. That number or that well, uh, what, what, uh, as we talked about earlier about Tesla's international expansion, that includes Europe in Asia. So I, okay. I I sort of put China in there. And I mean it was a good question that they could they could launch in China sooner because like in the past few weeks they had they have been holding sort of uh showcases event with the Model 3. Like they go in malls and they, they do their pop-up mm -hmm. store in malls, which they used to do with the Model S and X, but now they did it with the Model 3. <laughs> Uh, maybe like a full a full year ahead of uh, a full year ahead of the actual launch. So that sound that sounds kind of weird, but at the same time, uh, like, and also uh, people are thinking since Tesla is planning a, uh, a manufacturing facility in China, are they going to wait to produce their own model in China, which sounds risky because it could be like two or three years away at this point. Right, and but it would save them quite a bit of money. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, what, what is the tax right now? It was twenty five percent, and it got lowered recently 15. to ten or fifteen. Fifteen, I think. Okay. A uh, bunch of other people. Uh, Singer director of uh, government affairs, so uh, field delivery operations, director of logistic operation, uh, regional sales director for uh, Europe and uh, and Middle East. So, so some pretty significant hires, but. Um, Nothing too high profile coming a lot from Amazon. I think like a bunch of them were, were from Amazon, a bunch of them from GM, BMW. Yeah, Apple. they all seem to be like name brand hires instead of hiring, mm -hmm. you know, somebody out of college or somebody from some company, logistics company you've never heard of. Yeah, so like, yeah, they're, they're, all, 
they're, they're all directors anyway, so it's you know, it's pretty uh, um, people with more experience. Uh, that was a a few days, like er, early this week or even like last Friday maybe. maybe. Uh, and now today, the uh, no, two, uh, yesterday, when was that? The thirty first. That was yesterday. They announced two other hires, uh, a little bit higher up this time too. Uh, Sanjay Shah uh, is going to be Tesla's new senior VP of uh, energy operations. So uh, SVP, that's uh, pretty uh, like the highest level that you can have uh, aside from a C level employees, which Tesla doesn't have many of. And so he's going to take over the uh, energy operation. He's coming from. Dell, uh, no, Sanjay was coming from uh, Amazon, Amazon too. So he was working right, at Amazon. Dell, then Amazon again. So that's uh, that's a few from Amazon that came out. So a big logistic guy from uh, Amazon as American fulfillment centers, and he's going to be replacing. Uh, uh, that's a pretty big loss for Tesla, though. Uh, Cal Langton. Cal Langton has been an executive at Tesla for a long time. He started out by uh, managing Tesla supercharger network. So from very beginning, I think, like. Uh, or maybe 2013. So either either the very beginning or like a few months into the program, he started managing uh, the um, supercharger network. It was coming from ABB. Uh, ABB is also, of course, a big manufacturer of charging station. And uh, over the the past few years, he, his role has expanded at Tesla. Most recently, took over energy um, uh, the energy operation from uh, from what's its face. Uh, uh, Lyndon Rive, um, Elon Musk's cousin, who was, of course, co-founder and CEO of SolarCity. When Tesla acquired SolarCity, he took over the leadership of Tesla's energy division. When he left last year, Carl Linkton took over. And now Carl is apparently going uh, going away. Uh, depart. He's going to depart from Tesla. And so is taking over. So moving up the uh, chain a little bit, um... Uh, Tesla's having some issues uh, getting its board members uh, approved. Um, right, uh, there's I, at least some pushback. Yeah, some pushback. It's going to happen next week <laughs> or yeah. not. We don't. Know. Usually, these things get go through pretty smoothly. But um, you know, James Murdoch, as uh, you know, connected to Fox uh, News, very conservative, very uh, climate denying entity. Uh, kind of a weird choice to be on Tesla's board. And then I believe also uh, Elon's brother, Kimball, uh, is some facing some controversy, not because of anything he's done or you know his career, but because his relationship uh, to Elon. Is that... Is that... Yeah, well, uh, Kimball is not like... The, the the three of them are, I think, the biggest issue with because uh, the only like it's the CW investment group that has the biggest issue. They're the one like trying to uh, get some press about about this stuff uh, to 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 try to get them uh, off the board with the the reelection uh, next Tuesday because next Tuesday is a shareholder meeting. That's why we're talking about this. Um, next Tuesday, uh, actually, Tesla just tweeted about it because they want question. If you have any question, you can go to Tesla uh, for Elon Musk. I mean. And they, they, they're gonna try to answer them uh, next um, next Tuesday, but uh, before that uh, Q and A, there's gonna be the re-election of the three board members that you just mentioned: Kimball Musk, uh, um, Antonio Gracious, Gracious, and um, and yeah, James Murdoch. But uh, they're I, I, the way like I, I read a bunch of their stuff. But it's they are all over the place with this, and the main issue seems to be that. They don't have any experience with automakers, and uh, so they want people like independent. They, they're probably they're not independent of Elon Musk, which I, I don't think you can say that of James Murdoch, but you can definitely say it of uh, Kimball Musk, of course, with his brothers and uh, Antonio Gracias, who has a bunch of investment with uh, with Elon. Yeah, and and you know, uh, actually, uh, I heard on a, a Tim Ferriss podcast yesterday, which is really good with um, uh, Jervitson, um, who you know quite a bit of interesting stuff there, but um, there was an anecdote about uh, Gracias, Antonio Gracias, uh, basically, you know, when, when in 2008, when everything was kind of falling apart, he was like the one guy who, you know, had some money and, and was helping Elon out kind of getting Tesla in order. Uh, so I think there's a very co close relationship there. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know that they are, uh, definitely independent but i know that they work quite well together so 
you know, if, if I'm a Tesla shareholder, which I'm currently not, um, I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. Uh, you know, I, I don't know what, uh, the CTW investment groups, um, uh, motives are really, but, um, you know, I do have a problem with James Murdoch. Uh, <laughs> other I, people have, I think. Yeah. I, you know, I, I don't think it's really, I, I, I actually just, I'm curious, like what the thinking is behind, you know, of all the people to pick on the planet, uh, why pick a, you know, ultra conservative, uh, climate denying apparently he's not that's a thing apparently Mur james murdoch is like the uh, black sheep of the family and uh he's a uh, very liberal and is very pro uh environmentalist and and all that stuff so that's that's what i hear i've never met the guy right i uh never even seen much of a like decent interview of him other than like just sound bites and stuff like that so really not have a big opinion uh, on him uh but yeah, the, the logic behind it, like uh, I, that's what I don't get. Because if you want someone from the media industry, which that alone is a stretch for running an automaker and a, a technology company, um, the other person that they brought about Johnson, the the, the woman, uh, is also from uh, from the media industry. So if your goal was to have someone from the media industry, like you bring two at a time, sound weird. But anyway, I'm I'm pretty curious because I think it's gonna go through anyway. I think like most people just vote with the board, and the board is of course recommending that uh, all threes be reelected. I don't think Gracious and um, Antonio Gracious and uh, and Kimball uh, must gonna have any issue, uh, even though they don't have any like experience in the auto industry. They have been with the board uh, on Tesla's board since the almost the very beginning. So I mean, that alone is pretty much a lot of experience in the industry. Like they've been they've been at it for over ten years. So and during those 10 years as a uh, as that is issues they've been doing pretty well right now so uh, you don't you know you don't if you don't fix it if it ain't broke right right <laughs> uh but yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna be curious to see uh if someone doesn't go through it's gonna be murdoch but again i'm gonna be surprised if it doesn't go through um moving on from tesla the oil industry finally starting to get some what of uh, being affected by Norway's rapid electric vehicle adoption? So, of course, as you know, Norway is being pretty, pretty advanced in terms of uh, electric vehicle adoption. With now they are, they are often hitting over fifty percent of new cars being electric, which is pretty amazing. Uh, and so it gives us sort of like a glimpse into the future of uh, other bigger markets. Because I mean, like if you if you start talking about the U.S., like when is the U.S. going to be at fifty percent? It could be like easily like a decade away. Uh, so it give us like a pretty good idea of how a market uh, evolve with a uh, higher adoption rate of electric vehicles. Well, and you know what? I, so I recently did that story on the Kona in Norway, and I was looking back in Norway, and we have stories where like Norway is at thirty percent, at forty percent, mm -hmm. at fifty percent, and this is all within like two or three years. So I, you know, I think like I think there's a tipping point. I think Norway's beyond the tipping point, and we're watching what happens when the tipping point you know, falls over and lo and behold, the oil industry starts to cave in. Yeah. Starts to cave in. It's a big way to put it. Uh, what, what they are seeing is that, cause like you said, it's been like a few years now, like the 20, 30%, like the two years ago, they're already hitting that. Now they're hitting 50%. So there was a big, it's pretty short period of time too. Like we're starting since the Tesla revenue market, since the Leaf revenue market. That's when like the big numbers started coming in. So that was over just the last four years. But all over that period of time, the uh, gasoline and diesel sales were actually increasing in Norway. So the even though uh, EVs were uh, the, the adoption rate was going going up fast, uh, the overall market was going also fast. So it compensated for uh, for EVs and therefore gasoline and, and diesel sales were still going up. But the new numbers for 2017 just came out. And for the first time in 2017, for the first time since that EV revolution that we're, we're calling it, uh, it, it declined by 2.9% for gasoline and 2.7% for um, diesel. So not a huge decline, but a pretty significant one if you account for all those years before where it was going up, even though EVs were going on the market quite fast. So the first sign of uh, of the oil industry being affected. 
Right. And, and, you know, the big irony obviously is Norway gets a lot of its money from, uh, its oil reserves, uh, yeah. water. So it, it's kind of funny that, yeah, hey, Norway might be kind of hurting themselves, but there's plenty of people, uh, using oil and will be for quite a bit of time. Oh, yeah. yeah. The, that's the thing, the oil, uh, the petroleum products still when, uh, Overall petroleum, they can, oh, they decide, oh yeah, other petroleum like AV fuel, uh, oil, jet kerosene, and other petroleum products all, all went higher. So the only thing that went down was uh, uh, diesel and gasoline, but that's enough to uh, have an overall de decline too. So even though everything else went up, just the fact that gasoline and diesel went, went down affects the entire oil industry pretty significantly. Yeah, and I think that's like the way by far the way two biggest uses of. Uh, Petroleum is is uh, you know for the car products. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, and that fifty percent is gonna be affected a lot uh, a lot more with new EVs coming to market. So, of course, when the Model Three is gonna arrive, it's gonna be a big difference. But a few other cars gonna arrive in the market before the Model Three in Noria. I mean, and one of those cars is gonna be the Audi e-tron Quattro. And we uh, we had a big article on it this week because uh, Audi put it in the wind tunnel and uh, sent out a bunch of um, of stats on it and a few interesting things uh first off audi made it made a big thing uh about about the uh the drag coefficient of the e one quattro when it came out in 2015 they claimed that it was the most uh drag efficient aerial the, the highest aerial performance of any suv in the market with uh, a 2.5 they said i think originally 2.5 uh four was the uh, yeah 2.5 they said uh, uh, no 0.25 yeah 0.25 dry coefficient which was the best at the time for sure but then like two weeks later tesla came out with the model x <laughs> and they claim a, a 0.24 uh dry coefficient but that was uh so that was the production version of the model x versus the original concept of the h1 quattro so this week they have like the latest uh production prototype because the production vehicle is like coming out in a few months so if it's not the production vehicle, it's like very, very close to the, to the, the like it's a beta prototype of a or a pre-production prototype, if you will. And um, this one got a two point a, a point two eight, so very not not as good as the original one. Like, it seems yeah. like that grill on the front might be might make a difference. Know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, yeah, I, I'm not super good at that. I I do know that electric cars have like an incredible advantage. Because the, the the bottom of the car is flat or mm -hmm. typically flat, um, so you know you, you don't have the whole like um, exhaust system down there, uh, and and you know other stuff kind of uh, blocking the air. And then you know obviously uh, uh, regular internal combustion engines require a lot of uh, cooling, so that yeah. they push a lot of the air into the engine rather than around the car so you know that's that's an obvious advantage as well yeah for sure and the other big advantage of the h1 quattro is the mirrors which are non-existent <laughs> the uh, for, at least for that product pre-production version that they put in the wind tunnel they put one with the, the cameras instead of the exterior mirrors on it which of course make a big difference for for, for the direct coefficient since uh, the the surface of it is like three times smaller or something like that um and they made it sound like there's going to be an option. It's going to be available as an option. And we know that a few markets are starting like, to, to explore it. I, I think it's legal in Japan right now. Uh, maybe a few markets in Europe are, are going to be able to allow it. Um, though normally in Europe, they, they make it like a whole continent-wide thing, not just a poor country thing. Um, but I don't think it's yet legal in the U.S. Uh, though there was some discussions about it, but uh, I don't think, I don't think it, it, it's going through in the near future. So it sounds like it's going to be available and an option if in your own, if it's legal in your own market. Yeah, and you know, obviously Tesla's been playing around with that. The original Model X uh, had cameras instead of rear view mirrors uh, prototype, and then also the the new Tesla semis um, have. Uh, well, they came out with um, cameras instead of mirrors, but I think later on to make them street legal, uh, mirrors were put on them. Yeah, they're unveiling the ad cameras now. The siding that we see on the in the wild is uh, uh has those those side mirrors. But yeah, and it makes sense. I mean, uh, 
I mean, even then, like people were the other people that just don't use their mirrors anyways. <laughs> right. Might as well put cameras in there, and uh, it's going to be better for those people at least. Yeah, I mean, and if you've ever stuck your hand out the window with going 60 miles per hour, mm -hmm. you know that the, it's pretty serious uh, pull, you know, and that's basically sitting on your car all all the time. Yeah, definitely. So it's a big difference. Yeah, and I mean, and the technology works so well now too. Like, very rare that I have any issue with my uh, backup camera. Very rare. Of course, it can get dirty, but so so does a mirror, so it's not, yeah. not a big difference. And, but uh, yeah, I'm pretty. I'm, I'm interested to see what's going to happen with that. And of course, the RD Twin Quattro is supposed to launch later this year. Uh, people are talking about the price, uh, close to eighty thousand dollars, something like that. Uh, we're not exactly sure yet. Uh, the price was uh, just uh, in Germany so far, and they said eighty thousand euros. But that's with the taxes, so closer to sixty-seven thousand uh, euros, which would bring it close to seventy-eight thousand, eighty. 000, I think so right? seventy to eighty thousand would be probably. You know, a good, a good place to guess, uh, especially with the the uh, Jaguar, similarly priced. Um, you know, I, I, Audi's kind of a premium brand, so um, they're not gonna they're not gonna surprise us with a you know Kona forty thousand dollar. No, uh, they won't, but they should. <laughs> like, yeah, it would be nice. Yeah, it's not that big of an SUV too, so it's smaller than the Model X, and um, uh, it's gonna be priced pretty close to it. Though it, it looks more like a traditional SUV, and that alone, I think, is gonna it's gonna attract a market, uh, a different different type of buyers than the Model X. Which a lot of people don't like the design of the Model X. You just don't. Yeah, and and it looks like there's some more ground clearance, uh, so it can, maybe it can go uh, in the dirt a little bit more. Yeah, it might be. Yeah, like the Model X, it has a uh, air suspension that you adjust with uh, depending on the speed too. So. You can get more ground clearance, and when you are on the highway, it goes down, and you get better drag coefficient too. Moving on to GM, uh, what's up with GM this week? Uh, autonomous driving space. Uh, they make it. They, they themselves put out a lot of money, and they also got a new partner in uh, in SoftBank uh, to put a ton of cash into GM Cruise, which is the autonomous division that was born out of GM's acquisition of a uh, Cruise Automation, a small startup that was. Uh, Working on electric vehicles, they were uh, was started by Kyle Vogt, who was of course the co-founder of Twitch, uh, the streaming service. And it has, it, it, at least at the time, it had a bunch of uh, former Tesla autopilot engin engineers in there. And they were acquired for a cool a billion dollars from GM. That was back in 2016. Since then, uh, we've reported a bunch of time on the effort with the Bolt TV prototype, like the they made a fully autonomous Bolt TV, basically. And a few impressive videos came out where it uh, looks like they had some decent technology in there. Of course, it's like geo geofence in San Francisco and uh, Arizona, and uh, now in Michigan too. Uh, like over a hundred prototypes driving around, but they want to expand that a lot. They are, uh, I think, they feel a lot of competition with uh, with Waymo because they want a similar service as Waymo, but of course adapted just to GM's vehicle instead of Waymo going with uh, with Chrysler and with uh, Jaguar and so on. But the, the service is the same. Like they want their captive fleet, so it's their home fleet of vehicle offering a a, a, a ride a sharing service, ride hailing service that is driverless. And um, to get that to market as soon as next year, they put up uh, another billion dollars into the company, and they got South Bank to invest uh, uh, two two point five. Yeah. Uh, two point two. Yeah. Two point five. Two point two five billion. Mm -hmm. uh, starting with nine hundred million. And they think that 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 900 million and GM's 1.1 billion, so a total of two billion, is going to be enough to bring that technology to market next year. And as soon as it's ready for commercialization, uh, SoftBank is going to put the rest of their, their 2.2 to just accelerate that in a big way. So, I mean, if you think about it, once you're in the market with it, once you're ready to go to market, you have the production ready to 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 have those cars, like a billion, like 1.35 billion. Yeah, it's also that, interesting. That goes a lot of cars. <laughs> you know that um, you know SoftBank's putting two point two five billion uh, into the venture, and they're and at the end of that, um, that gives them twenty percent of GM Cruise. So that kind of values GM Cruise at about you know eleven billion dollars, which is pretty big valuation oh, for 
ton of money right now in those startups. It's, it's right. It's a ton of money, but still, it's not, it's a lot of money. Yeah, for something that's kind of unproven. Yeah, and okay, because what is it, right? It's it's a hundred or so prototype, like maybe two hundred at this point. Right. And the software and those prototypes. That, that's basically it. I a mean, there's a bunch of engineers around. Yeah, the, the, and the but, engineer that that did but, those. <laughs> but those guys are like coming and going pretty quickly. Oh yeah, they're getting offers everywhere, every time. Like yeah, as soon as uh, as they. They put out their CV somewhere. It's uh, they, they get a ton of offer because it's, it's just uh, turnover is insane right now in those startups. Well, I'm I'm calling it a startup, but like it's pretty much a division of GM at this point, a subsidiary of GM, we should we should say. Um, BMW, BMW this week had also a few news uh, in the EV world, starting with uh, a major I'm quoting here major increase in capacity at their battery factory in China. So uh, Jim has its own battery factory in China and their, their, their joint venture called uh, BMW Bryant's, Bryant's Automotive. And um, they, are start, they already started making uh, batteries for their uh, plug-in hybrids in China. But now they are going to double that production to uh, support the upcoming BMW iX3. So we're pretty excited about the iX3. Apparently it's going to be somewhat affordable and it's going to be another vehicle that's going to compete with the uh, uh, Audi e tron Quattro and uh, and those all those SUVs coming to market, uh, electric SUVs, and they aim to start a production in China first. So uh, I'm not clear on that because uh, I think they're gonna start production in China and Germany. Then they want to export the car. I'm not sure if they're gonna export the car from China though, because that's what Volvo wants to do with their first EV. So I know that uh, some international automaker are gonna try to do some export from EVs produced in China. I'm not sure if it's gonna be the case from the iX3. But they're gonna have some decent production for it. That's what it sounds like. Yeah, I mean, I think there'd be quite a bit of demand for it. Uh, you know, BMW's got a little bit of electric uh, uh, in their uh, lineup. Yeah, but you know, basically, it's the i3 at this point, um, which they haven't really upgraded significantly. And then a, a whole bunch of their cars have like about 10 miles of electric before they switch over to gas. Yeah. Um, so, you know, having a full EV would be quite a big deal, um, especially yeah. in a segment. You know, the i3 is kind of a, it's a strange car, strange looking car. Uh, a lot of people love the, the look and design. I think it's pretty neat, but, a you lot. know, what's that? A lot. Yeah, show me some some source on that. <laughs> yeah, well, a few people, a few people like it. Um, I, you know, I, I I actually think it's not a bad design. I you know the, the suicide doors aren't really convenient if you're dropping your kids off or something, but um, you know, it's an interesting car. Uh, at least they made it. It has goofy tires that are you know look like they belong on motorcycles. So it's quirky. This car, this uh, SUV, seems like way more mainstream. Uh, it looks like a you know SUV. It's got some interesting uh, wheels, but other than that, it looks like it could be just a regular uh, get you know ICE uh, BMW. So I think, hey, let's try something. Let's try not selling a weird mobile uh, with electric and see how it does. I think it'll do quite well. I like I like for a moment. Can you hear? Me? Yeah, I just lost you for a second. I lost you. Are you back? So we lost Fred. So I think we'll go to the next. Uh, the next uh, story is uh, also about BMW and their uh, wireless charging. Um, Can you hear me right now? Yeah, you're back. Uh, yeah, I'm back. All right, sorry about that. I lagged out for a moment. Uh, pretty. Pretty much have too much uh, article too much, open at the same time. <laughs> too much ambient. Uh, <laughs> too much ambient. No, too much article open at the same time on my browser. I think, but yeah, uh, you were just talking about the MWs, uh, plug-in hybrids. I know have really short range, nothing too impressive, and one of those is going to get the wireless charging option. So it sounds like it's going to be expanded to all of uh, BMW's electric lineup. But right now, it's only with the BMW 530e. Um, plug-in hybrid, like we said. 
And that was announced last year, the BMW wireless charging system. But now it's going out in production, and uh, you can order it with the vehicle starting now in Germany and soon in the U.S., Japan, and China. It's a two, uh, 3.2 kilowatt system that uh, gets the chargers get installed in the factory when you order with the option. And then you get the ground pad that you can have installed in your garage or also outside or pretty much anywhere. And you just have to uh, uh, park on top of it and it's going to start charging at up to 3.2 kilowatts. And that's the bummer. An efficiency rate of 85%, which is 5 to 10% lower than the uh, plugged in system. Uh, system yeah, and I, I wonder if that's 85% of that or if it's 85% of just you know off the wall um i think the wall yeah either way it's it's not great um and 3.2 kilowatts is not fast charging at all nope. um you know let do easy math if you're getting 3.2 kilowatt and you do that for 10 hours overnight that gives you 32 kilowatts of charge which is about half of a chevy bolt so you could you could charge your chevy bolt half overnight which you know that's not that's not great. Uh, you know, bigger, bigger batteries will even, you know, I'm assuming the BMW SUV is going to have probably, you know, 75. So you're talking about three nights or, you know, 30 hours. Um, if on this, to zero. Uh, yeah, if you're down to zero to, to go from zero to full. So, you know, I don't know what this pad is actually for, I guess maybe, you know, those same people who are, uh, you know, excited about getting 10 miles of electric range will be excited about not having to plug in which takes you know less than 30 seconds um so i don't know i don't i don't quite less get that five seconds yeah I, I i don't know what this uh this is for i think i think the people who have never plugged in before are like oh you know like what do you have to do you have to like you open the thing and then you get the th get the thing off the wall and you got to look at it and what, you know, it takes a while to do all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, I, I literally almost don't even stop walking. Like, you know, I'll, yeah. I'll be walking by it and I'll be like, you know, and, uh, so but I don't, it takes no time at all. It, 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 it's a lazy thing to, it's, but I mean, it's, it's lazy. It, people are doing it with cell phones. So yeah. Yeah. But it's a lazy thing for the owner, but, I think it's more it's lazy from BMW or for the the retail's perspective of it because when you take into account the efficiency loss on top of it then it makes no sense at all like for cuz it's a convenient thing okay for sure it's a little bit more convenient than a plug-in like a very little bit uh so the only way I say that, uh, that people are trying to sell that so if you at the dealership you go buy uh, an electric BMW then uh, you start talking about charging, and you, the, the the salesman sees that uh, there's some frictions in terms of charging and the charging experience. So they try to sell that instead. They say, "Oh, well, you can have like three thousand bucks. You can have the option to uh, uh, not plug it at all and just go wireless." And uh, then they say, "Oh, okay, I'm I'm gonna go do that." Like if you're rich people buying a BMW 5 Series, like it can make sense for you. But when he does that, though, the salmon doesn't. Does he explain that uh, you get a higher efficiency loss, which means that uh, you spend more electricity to charge your car and lose more electricity, which, of course, is another costing. Maybe they don't mind about the costing, but then it's uh, also an environment thing. You consume more energy that you don't even end up using, really. Um, yeah, it's probably lost as heat or something. Yeah. So I wonder. Do, I wonder. Do you explain that. I don't think they will. I wonder if you can charge both. Like if you can be on a pad and plug in at the same time and get more charging you mean yeah, like, like to a double, faster rate yeah whatever i uh, don't if he it's used because it, that's uh, an ec charger so it used the onboard charger so i'm pretty sure it's it, oh it's ac it's gonna, okay yeah it's going to use the same charger i think right i don't know i didn't i didn't look into it too much it's a good question yeah so i don't think they can charge both at the same time all right should we move on to the hyundai kona yeah, that was your pulse this week. Yeah, so this yeah. this is a product I, or a car that I, I'm actually a little excited about, and I hope we get to review uh, because it is a economical uh, SUV ish uh, type of uh, you know more of a crossover type of car, but uh, it doesn't cost 
seventy thousand or eighty thousand, like the Audi and the Jaguar and and the Model X do, it costs forty thousand, with or less, uh, depending on uh, the conversion rate from uh, Norway. Uh, so, so the news was that Norway got prices and uh, three hundred twenty-five thousand nine hundred, uh, which Kroner. was Kroner, which is basically, but this is for the sixty-four kilowatt hour version, um, and base model. So this is not with leather or sunroof or any of the options they have, but still that equates to under forty thousand um, dollars, and that's the big battery pack, and we know that. Um, Hyundai was uh, going to offer a 40 kilowatt hour battery pack. So theoretically, even if it goes one to one price in the in the U.S., which you know oftentimes in the U.S. it's a little bit less expensive. Um, if they do that, um, then we're looking at you know mid mid to low 30s thousand dollar car uh, SUV, and with with a you know quite large uh, battery. Well, you know 40 kilowatt hour, not huge. Um, but, uh, we also know that Hyundai is very good at getting a lot of mileage, uh, per kilowatt. So, you know, my estimate, uh, on the back of the napkin was about 166 miles for the, the low range version. And, um, they are saying, <laughs> strangely, uh, close to 300 miles, uh, using the NEDC, uh, in the, in Europe, but they're saying 250 using, um, our EPA estimate. So somewhere... I think 250 is probably a safer bet. Um, so pretty compelling car. It doesn't look horrible. I mean, the inside certainly looks pretty nice. I think not, you know, probably not my cup of tea, but um, certainly this looks a lot like a nice uh, higher end uh, U.S. car. And, you know, the outside, uh, it seems like they've taken some time to make, you know, the wheels look pretty nice. The the shape's pretty good. Um, you know, they, they sell the Kona in an ICE version. Um, so the kind of like the, uh, the Ionic where they have the hybrid and the, the fully, um, uh, electric version. Yeah. That, that's my, that's my problem with this. Yeah. It's because there's an, a high version too. That's going to be a lot cheaper. They're going to end up, it's going to end up um, a lot like, like the Ionic. So it's a good car and everything, but they're going to produce like low volume. Yep. And people are only going to buy it where there's incentive to it too. Right. So I, the it'll Kona's be in gonna, California. Basically. Yeah, it's going to be in California. It's going to be in those markets. It's going to be in Europe. But other than that, it's going to be hard to get your hands on it because like uh, how much is the Kona? I think the Kona isn't even 20,000, right? Like it starts at. I think it's around twenty thousand. Yeah. Yeah, twenty thousand. So if this one starts at forty, well, or, or like thirty-five or something for the base version, uh, like most people, like if you're looking for an electric vehicle, yeah, for sure that's gonna be great because there's just not that many options that that in that segment for a long-range vehicle. But for converting people to electric, if they go to the dealership and they have a Kona, a high Kona at twenty thousand dollars. And an electric an EV Kona at um, forty, it's going to be a tough sell. So if there's an incentive like a eight thousand dollar or more or something like that, that starts to make sense. Other than that, I think it's not going to be a, a huge impact on, on the overall EV adoption. I think. Well, it's 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 unfortunate because the Ionic that Hyundai made was quite quite a good car. Although we uh, one of our writers, Jordan, uh, his had an issue that the dealers weren't very good at fixing. Although I think he since got it fixed. Anyway, um, I test drove it. I thought it was a great base level car. Um, you know, I, my, my car a couple years ago was a Prius, um, and the Ionic kind of compares pretty well to the Prius. Um, but, you know, it had CarPlay and Android Auto, and it had, you know, a lot of nice features, and it, it's the most efficient electric vehicle still to this day on the market at 136 miles per gallon E. Um, so, like Hyundai can make a good electric car. It's just like somewhere between the engineering and the, the selling of it, you know, something gets lost. And, uh, you know, we know that, um, people are lining up to get the, the Ionic EV and they just can't make enough of them. They, yeah. they just, they don't even have the battery supply chain to, to make enough of these things. So, you know, it, it, it is kind of unfortunate, but you know, if you, if you work hard and you, you know, and you, you kind of drill down your Hyundai dealer, 
uh, you may be able to get one of these for 35,000 and then, you know, 7,500 off of that and whatever state incentives. So you're talking about like a $25,000, uh, you know, in California and New York and stuff. Uh, and California you also have the subscription thing, I think, which also could be, uh, if, 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 it, if the mileage that is, uh, uh, unable uh, if you if they allow the mileage that works with your commute and your daily driving I, I think there are some good deals there too yeah and also um additionally this one charges a little quicker than the uh ionic it also oh, yeah. has a, a lot more power uh not a ton more speed like i think the zero to 60 is like seven and a half seconds so it's a little bit more i mean the interior looks a little bit nicer it's a little bit more premium than the ionic um but you know, the out the door price, uh, approaching $25,000 $25, for that car, not bad. Yeah, yeah, definitely something to think about. But again, I, I'm curious to see when it actually comes out, the availability of it in the markets. We're gonna check. We're gonna uh, let you go this week with a quick uh, mention of Waymo. Uh, we talked about GM Cruise. I think it's gonna be the big competitor to Waymo right now. Um, Big order of Chrysler Pacifica hybrid minivans. Uh, did, well, not necessarily. Yeah, they, they did say Pacifica, but right now they're using hybrid, so we assume that they want still want hybrid. But the fleet is up to sixty-two thousand more. So, big fleet of all electric vehicles they're looking to convert, uh, and that follows the uh, twenty thousand or so order for the uh, Jaguar High Pace too. So the right. So you're coming up on a hundred thousand vehicles. Yeah, 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 for sure. And they already that's on top of the previous order of a few thousands that they did earlier uh this year, which should start being delivered by the end of the year. And of course, the the thing is, where are they gonna come from? Those specific hybrids, uh, if they're still going with the hybrids, because it's apparently very hard to get your hands on a uh, on the Pacifica hybrid right now. So maybe they're just all going to to Google and that that's it. Uh Waymo, I should say. Um so yeah, it's gonna be interesting, and it looks like if again if they are sticking with the hybrid version, which is actually a plug-in hybrid version, uh, the Pacifica likes to Chrysler likes to call it just a hybrid. Uh, it looks like at least Waymo is going electric with their all uh, with their autonomous vehicles. So that's an, yeah, that's, it, does, uh, it does seem like Google's going there, and I think Google's smart and they know where the market's gonna be in three to five years. So good for them. Yeah, and good for everyone. Sixty thousand more. Partially electric vehicles on the road. Yeah, and, and 20,000 Jaguar. So, <laughs> yeah, the Jaguar going to be crazy too. Uh, and that could come out in Phoenix as soon as the, um, not those 60,000, of course, but a few thousand of those and in, in the Jaguar in Phoenix by the end of the year. Uh, it should be an announcement for that in the coming months from Waymo. And that's going to be it for us this week, guys. Thanks a lot for listening live on uh, YouTube and uh, watching after the fact uh, and uh, audio version on your podcast app too. You can uh, leave a review, leave a comment, leave some feedback. We already really appreciate it. Uh, also, we have our Patreon, patreon.com slash electric. If you contribute there, that helps electric a lot, both the podcast and the blog. Uh, and uh, we're going to see you next week. Bye-bye.